Is Alexis here? Don't see him. Brendan Burns. Don't see him. Brian Grant. And then Michelle. So we got five out of six. Okay. Cool. Let's uh, let's get started. Uh, Liz, you want to go lead, and we'll get the communities to present. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can have a go if my voice holds out. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I don't think we have very much uh, other than leaping straight into the community presentations, but uh, let's let's do it. So Thanos, who do we have from Thanos? Yeah, it's me, Bartek and Frederick. Awesome. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bartek Plotka and uh, work for the Global. I don't know. I can hear anything. Hello. Hello. Can you hear? Um, so yeah, um, I work for Improbable, and I'm one of the maintainers and initial authors of the Thanos project. And today, together with Frederick, who would love to present it uh, to the CNCF. So first of all, uh, what is Thanos? Um, Thanos is a monitoring system, or in other words, set of cloud-native components that you can install on top of the Prometheus, which is a graduated CNCF project. Um, you can easily add Thanos to your Prometheus servers that are continuously collecting metrics potentially from multiple Kubernetes clusters. Thanks of that setup, you can um, solve four main drawbacks of running Prometheus on scale, um, which is, first of all, querying your metrics from the single place, um, so what we call a global view, uh, making Prometheus highly available, so finally, allowing zero loss for rolling restarts of Prometheus or gracefully handling failover scenarios. Um, and fin finally, supporting cheap and easy to operate way um, to store virtually unlimited retention for your metrics with efficient support for long time range queries thanks to built in uh, sampling. Next slide, please. Um, thanks. Um, Thanos project is quite unique in making sure you can deploy and experiment without major changes to your existing monitoring uh, Prometheus setup. We can distinguish three main deployment models for Thanos um, without going into much details in a very basic one presented in, on this slide. You don't need to set up any separate resources, nodes, or clusters for Thanos. You just add a sidecar, any um, you just add a start card to each of your Prometheus server and a fully stateless query on top of it. Query then is able to execute PromQL query uh, on a global level, fetching the metrics from required Prometheus sources. It's also capable of transparent duplication, which allows to run Prometheus in HA groups. In this form, it does not enable long-term metrics, but um, it is quite obvious option if you want to start with Thanos project. And in fact, some production users we know successfully stays with this option because it's already matching their requirements. Next slide, please. If you want to add long-term metrics retention, you can easily set up Thanos to upload Prometheus files in a native TSDP format to object storage of your choice. Then you can connect global query to the long-term uh, object storage um, using exactly the same common single string gRPC API. This allows for relatively cheap storage without worrying about you know, high bandwidth, low latency sample streaming and complex replicate, replicated ingestion path in some cases. Currently, Thanos supports a variety of object storages. Um, we have GCS, S3, Azure, OpenStack Swift, Tencent COS, and uh, Alibaba OSS, which is um, in progress. All of those, except GCS, were added thanks to our external contributors. Uh, next slide, please. Last deployment option is still experimental, but Thanos also will allow sample streaming, uh, which eventually will be able to immediately transfer metrics out of the Prometheus um, to the separate Thanos cluster in real time. So you don't need to access Prometheus in, in query time, essentially. This option is a bit more complex um, to operate, uh, so it's not for everyone, but it adds more options to choose from when running Thanos, especially in the case when you don't have direct access to Prometheus servers, for example. Um, next slide, please. Why you can say that Thanos is uh, simple and flexible? So first of all, all those, all those free deployments we mentioned um, kind of showcase, showcase ability of the Thanos project to be shaped and tailored to your needs. Um, in fact, you can have a mix of those free deployment models uh, under a single centralized system, which many of production users are doing. 
Furthermore, it is simple because you can incrementally deploy tunnels once you, once you or your business model progress. This also really helps avoiding scope script during the migration process um, and help with initial experimenting as well. Um, one of the TANOS goals is also to make sure uh, we keep low maintenance cost. This aims to have simplicity and level of reliability close to the Prometheus, where you don't need a full team to maintain it and operate. Essentially, you only want to access it when you need it. Um, we are also focusing on having very simple and unified APIs. The query layer does not need to understand from what place the metrics are. Um, what place that the metrics come from. They can be fetched from Prometheus directly, or object storage, or another query layer, or from totally different solution. For example, um, some company built and maintain open TSDP integration. This simplifies things a lot and allows further customizations. We also build tunnels while reusing and contributing as much as possible to the Prometheus code base. Um, tunnels is not meant to reinvent things like query language. We are here really to make those pieces more distributed, a uh, bit more cloud native and scalable. And um, finally, it has essentially single and optional dependency, which is an object storage. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how we look in terms of community? Um, we are fully open source under Apache 2 license. Um, we establish code of conduct. And to be honest, we are quite surprised with the growth of the community and the wide adoption. We are quite popular project on GitHub. We are extremely grateful for a really large amount of external contributions. We hit 117, I think, unique contributors mark. We have a Thanos website with roughly 100 daily viewers. We have a Twitter account for announcements and very active Slack channels um, with more than 600 users. We are also excited that we are able, we were able to build quite large maintainers base. Um, there are five maintainers and three official users that helps us to triage the GitHub issues. We believe this is a quite big responsibility and, and hard work. So it shows a big commitment from everyone involved. Um, also, the unique thing about our team is that almost all of us um, are from the different company, uh, which is nice. Finally, it's worth to mention that although we are in improbable organization right now on GitHub, we already reserved Thanos IO organization and we are slowly moving uh, to that. I think uh, donation to the CNCF will definitely accelerate this process. Um, now, I believe it's uh, time for Frederic to tell us more about uh, Thanos adopters and production users. Thank you, Bartek. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we have a number of production adopters in our call here. Um, so Shang from Alibaba um, and someone from Monzo and uh, from and Ben from GitLab as well. Um, so uh, this is just a selection of companies that have been asked uh, or have asked us to be on this presentation. And uh, some of those are also in this call, should you have any questions for them. Um, so I think one thing that's very interesting about um, the production adopters um, is the kind of model in which they run Thanos. So in comparison to many of the other projects out there um, in, the, in a similar space, Thanos is almost exclusively used to satisfy these companies, the, the metrics needs for these companies themselves, as opposed to like a software as a service model, for example. So I think this is kind of unique uh, to the to the Thanos project, um, and uh, we think why or, or it's a reason why uh, a lot of companies are using it because Thanos works really well in this kind of case. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the history. So Bartek, um, who's who uh, just presented, and Fabian Reinhardt uh, were the original creators at Improbable um, in late 2017. Um, and in early 2018, the project was first publicly um, announced at the London Prometheus user group. Um, and <clears throat> while it was launched there first, um, or announced first, I think um, what really kicked it off for the community was um, the uh, S3 object storage support, which was added in early March 2018. And I think this is kind of a milestone for the project because 
and probably nominally didn't need um, S3 support. And this was entirely driven by the community. So it, like two months after the project was first announced, the community started contributing to this in a really meaningful way. So I think this is, this is really awesome. And then in March, 2019, uh, first maintainers outside of Improbable were introduced. And now we're here um, proposing the project to the CNCF sandbox. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of alternatives and there are of course a lot more monitoring systems out there. We decided uh, to keep the list um, to those that are most closely related to Thanos. So there is Cortex, which is already a CNCF project. Cortex is quite similar to um, the third deployment option that Batek showed us, where essentially Prometheus replicates its database to a remote place and Cortex um, ingests that. And M3DB, created by Uber, um, has a distinct integration mechanism with Prometheus, but it is able to handle those uh, Prometheus data as well. Um, Victoria Metrics is kind of similar to Cortex in the sense that it has a similar API and a similar deployment, deployment um, model. And InfluxDB, which nominally wasn't born in the Prometheus world, but also accepts the remote write protocol, which is the protocol that um, the other projects on, on this list here use to replicate this data. Uh, next slide, please. So how does Thanos relate to uh, the other CNCF projects? So we've already mentioned it a couple of times, but I think it's worth calling out again. Um, Thanos makes use of absolute vanilla upstream uh, Prometheus. So there's absolutely no modification. We You can take the um, released tarballs created by the, or released by the Prometheus project, um, or the container images published by the Prometheus project and uh, put the Thanos components next to this and essentially grow all of this from your vanilla Prometheus setup that you already have and grow your setup into, into this distributed Prometheus, one could say. Um, and everything is built around this as opposed to modifying or forking. Um, then Thanos makes heavy use of gRPC, and this is not just because gRPC is a CNCF thing, but um, we actually make heavy use of streaming, for example, and this heavily benefits to the performance of the project um, in a very positive way. Um, all of Thanos communication internally and externally is instrumented with open tracing, and Jaeger and Google Cloud Tracer are the two adapters that are um, currently available for this. And while not tied to Kubernetes, um, there's um, Thanos was kind of born into the world of Kubernetes. So a lot of the examples are for Kubernetes. There is a direct integration with the Prometheus operator for uh, deploying Thanos with the Prometheus operator. There are Helm charts, customized templates, and a bunch of blog posts um, describing how to how to run Thanos on on Kubernetes. But I think. Um, even though there is all of this relationship, I just want to point out Thanos is in no way tied to Kubernetes, um, but it's just thriving within that ecosystem. Next slide, please. So um, we make heavy use of Prometheus, right? So how does, how does Thanos actually stand in terms of a relationship with the Prometheus project? So a number of pieces are actually literally vendored. So we, in order to be able to compatible with the, with the Prometheus project, we don't actually need to spend much time on that. We literally vendor the same code for the PromQL engine, for example, and the time series database is also exactly the same as what Prometheus uses. Um, and so we're not here to reinvent the wheel. We're here to uh, make a distributed version of Prometheus. And so like the, the time series database, the query engine, and the alerting engine, um, all are exactly the same. Um, and as a matter of fact, Batag and I are actually both also Prometheus core team members and Thanos maintainers. And um, aside from that, other maintainers of Thanos are also heavily contributing to the Prometheus ecosystem meetups. These are online meetings that take place every month where the community meets and uh, can ask questions and discuss things. And this is also led by one of the other Thanos maintainers, among others. Next slide, please. So why do we think um, the CNCF sandbox is the right thing for Thanos? 
So um, I think first and foremost is uh, the neutral ground. So a number of companies have approached us and have said, we would really like to contribute to the Thanos project, um, but we want it to be on neutral ground for us to, for that to happen. Um, in the same way, people want to talk about how they're using um, Thanos in their, in their, within their company, but they want uh, a neutral ground um, to be able to do that. And a further one is there have been discussions with other projects in the CNCF um, about potentially merging efforts. Um, and this would be a safe space uh, for, for our projects to, to explore that. Now, whether that will ever happen, we don't know, but it's a safe space for us to be able to explore that, those ideas. Um, and as we've already said, we have a really strong relationship with already graduated Prometheus project. Um, and even there, there, we've had discussions that maybe one day um, these things could be folded back into the Prometheus project. And again, we don't know if that's going to happen, but um, for that to be ever be a, be a possibility, um, we would need to be part of the CNCF and be on a neutral ground together. And uh, last but not least, we think Thanos fits really well into the like portfolio of uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation project. Um, as we've, I think we've already shown, we make you have a use of these technologies and just, I think it, it's a benefit to the ecosystem to extend this portfolio with Thanos. And next slide, that's it. We um, are seeking one more TOC sponsor. Shang generously has already offered uh, to sponsor. So we are looking for at least one more. Of course, we would be very happy uh, with more. But that is the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer those. Thank you. Thanks. I'm actually why? curious to know why, uh, why sandbox and why not incubation level? What do you think you don't currently have that meets the incubation criteria? That was my question, Liz. <laughs> oh, we think the same, Joe. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think we've actually um, discussed it that much. Um, I think, I think we just thought that that's the, the entry model. Um, so I think we could discuss incubation more um, if you think that would be more appropriate. I think there's certainly a large user base already out there. Yeah, I think that uh, the user, certainly brand names is, is really impressive. That's, that's really nice to see. So yeah, I think we'd, we'd be more than happy to already see it in incubation. I think, you know, you have sort of the activity, you have the diversity of, of contributors, um, you know, you have the production usage that ticks a lot of the, a lot of the boxes. I was just going to say, I'm happy to sponsor also. Um, I know Alexis just put it on, uh, uh, Thank you. he's happy yeah. to sponsor in the, in the chat. I would be as well. I mean, I think it's pretty much a, a, a clear, clear, definitely going to get into sandbox and perhaps we, we should have a conversation about, you know, whether there are any criteria that, need looking at before incubation. But I think Sandbox, Fantastic. any questions, any thoughts of why we shouldn't? All right, congratulations Thanos, you are in the Sandbox. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Kiva, is, is it Kiva up next? Should be. Oh, there's yes. some append slides, but we'll, we'll skip those. Go ahead, Fabian. Well, what was yeah. that we missed? Was it? <laughs> okay, whatever. Hey, uh, hello, this is Fabian from Red Hat. Uh, could I kindly ask you to reload the slides? I just added some additional comments here and there. Awesome, great. So here we go. All right. So hello, I'm Fabian from the uh, Qbert project. Um, and that is the second slide. Please go one slide back. Backwards, please. That's you're going forward. Uh, yeah, there, there we go. All right. So Qbert. Qbert was started in 2016. Uh, 16, so it's already quite old. Um, the main driver back then um, for us to, to start with Qbert was um, that we wanted to have a single orchestrator for both 
um, compute form factors, right? We knew that containers were coming up, and, but we also saw that VMs are still around. Um, and with Qbert, we, we said, right, that's fair, but we don't see that all VMs are going over to, to containers. So we need to provide a platform to run both. And this platform should acknowledge the differences between these different form factors, right? Um, both form factors have different properties and different life cycles, different uh, workflows. And we want to be able to, to, map, uh, to acknowledge both and properly handle both. Um, in general, the, the pragmatic statement we came up with back then was to say, um, even if we, if we want to run virtual machines inside of Kubernetes, um, it is important to us that we maintain the Kubernetes uh, or cloud native look and feel when working with those feature, uh, virtual machines over having all the virtualization fe features that exist in the virtualization world today. For example, the CPU and memory hot plugging is one of the examples which might land soon in Kubernetes or something like that, but which wasn't clear back then. We said, so we don't provide those features in order to not conflict with, with Kubernetes too much. Um, one outcome of saying we want to address both workloads was also that we could unify the stack, right? So we said we are interested in, in bare metal deployments and um, having VMs and containers on the same platform on Kubernetes would allow us to, to also unify the, the underlying infrastructure, so storage network um, and the supporting um, technologies like authentication logging uh, metrics and so on and so forth. Um, after a small research period um, in 2016, we actually open sourced Qbert in, the, in January of 2017. Um, we, we moved along and we, we did um, releases from the beginning. We saw a little bit of community attention, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. All of this was released under the Apache 2, or is still released under the Apache 2 license. Next slide, please. So what does Qbert do? For most, Kubert provides a comprehensive API to run virtual machines on Kubernetes. And those are virtual machines as you know them, right? So if you're running VirtualBox or uh, virtual, uh, Virt Manager on Linux or VMware Workstation, you know these kind of VMs are what we want to run. It's also the same VMs you would be running on OpenStack, for example. We have different properties, or we're inher inheriting the properties of scale, for example, from Kubernetes. So if I mention OpenStack, it doesn't mean that we want to you know, meet all of the OpenStack or other projects requirements, but we say we want to run virtual machines um, in the constraints that Kubernetes is providing to us. The API um, today is supporting to define virtual device, devices as you can do with other virtual machines. We can do live migration um, in, a, in a Kubernetes friendly way. So we don't provide live migration. We do not provide live migration for pods, but we do provide live migration for virtual machines. Um, we allow to have multiple NICs, uh, which is actually backed by Multus. Um, we would support um, booting from raw disk images, and we can boot a range of Linux distributions and uh, actually Microsoft Windows, which was also one of our, our goals back then. Um, in general, um, this is based on, on, on Libert and KVM and QEMU, so a well proven set of technologies, which is also used in other projects like OpenStack and Overt. And um, this also means that we, we inherit that robustness which was brought to these projects over the years. Qbert is also Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes native application. What does it mean? That Qbert itself um, tries to integrate with the cluster. So we are an add-on to Kubernetes, right? Um, so you um, deploy Qbert on top of Kubernetes and then you can right away reuse um, the cluster resources like storage, network services, but also the compute resources, right? So wherever pods can run. In addition, we can uh, leverage node level um, features like the CPU manager work or multi-network, huge pages, MTDR and block storage. All of these have been Kubernetes features which uh, came into uh, Kubernetes over the past years. And we were improving Kubernetes uh, in order to allow us using those features as well for VMs. Sometimes this requires some, some small glue in order to, to make a feature usable for virtual machines, but often it's also just a pass through. For example, huge pages, it's really simple to, to address or to provide that feature to virtual machines. Um, 
because it's so simple to, to adopt the virtual machines to the feature provided by Kubernetes. Other, um, other features are more difficult to consume, for example, CPU manager, and that is where we actually still have it on our list, or we were already engaging in the upstream discussion to also see that we solve the problem this, this technology is addressing for both C, uh, for pods and for virtual machines. Um, and furthermore, we're just not only integrating with Kubernetes, but we also try to see that we integrate into the ecosystem. So as Prometheus was also mentioned early on, uh, Kubert is also providing metrics, virtual machine specific metrics um, in, in Prometheus compatible endpoints. On the other hand, it also means that the VMs are, can actually also be seen through the regular uh, Kubernetes metric endpoints. If we then look at further how, how it's being implemented and how we extend Kubernetes, that is by using the all state of the art, uh, art technologies like CRDs, um, the custom API servers, administration webhooks to do validation and mutation. We use client go gRPC, which is also a CNCF project. Um, so there's a range of projects we, we pick up. We actually try to see what we can pick up before we build it ourselves. All of this leads to, to a situation where we can really do a simple kubectl apply minus F or three times at least, and then you have, um, you extended your Kubernetes cluster to be able to run virtual machines. This actually was proven because we see that in our community we have a range of Kubernetes distributions, and for them, the, the approach we took is working. So we are seeing very few issues, for example, if you try to run Kubert on a cluster which is running on Ubuntu um, or some other Linux distribution. And over time, we were able to, we think we were able to maintain um, the Kubernetes native look and feel and behavior you're expecting from pods and other entities in Kubernetes itself. All right, please move along to the next slide. This is a great architecture diagram. Um, I don't want to go too much into it. Um, so what we're seeing here is basically that, that we have a, the usual operator pattern. So core is coined as operator pattern, but in the end, it's really the controller pattern that Kubernetes is, is using for all of its controllers. So if a custom resource, which is watched um, by a controller, which is shown, shown in the lower left, um, and um, speaking to a node agent called the vert handler, which is pretty much in the middle. And then interesting is that we use, that we ultimately run the VM, which is a little bit on the right of the middle, is that the VM is running inside a pod. So that makes it actually transparent for a lot of projects which you know, deal with Kubernetes and provide additional features around Kubernetes. To those projects, it's transparent if it's a VM or if it's a pod, because to them, it just looks like a pod. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So the use cases, what do we want to do? Um, I think the, the simple one is to run virtual machines to support the change. So we saw that people, or we assume that um, people want to go to containers. Containers have their use case after all, right? Um, but the reality is that all the VMs which were built over the last 20 years or so, um, not all of them can be moved to containers. So we need to provide a way to, to support the people in order to do the change where it's possible to move to containers, to increase their efficiency, um, and to lower their footprint. But we need to give them an escape hatch for stuff that cannot be moved to containers, right? So very old code or a code that cannot be moved due to licensing issues. Um, this is actually the two use cases you're seeing at the top. Uh, the other I also mentioned that before is to have a single stack, right? Um, that we want to have a single control plane, a single operational model um, to, to manage both virtual machines and pods. It's true that we provide different APIs for pods and virtual machines, but nevertheless, all the surrounding look and feel and tooling um, can be used to control both. So kubectl is the, or kubectl, depending on who you ask, is a tool of choice um, to manage both. We remain, uh, we maintain the stateless approach, uh, state uh, declarative approach, which is also used for all the other entities in Kubernetes itself. All right, next slide, please. What was surprising and um, what we didn't see initially was that Kubert is now also used to run Kubernetes actually for a hard multi-tenancy use case. Um, we saw actually a couple of community members who, who started to use Kubert in such a way uh, to run Kubert on a bare metal cluster and then use it to either, uh, yeah, to provide 
um, additional um, Kubernetes cluster to their tenants with with um, yeah with an hard isolation because these layered Kubernetes clusters are then run in, uh, in virtual machines. This also led to external projects like the Kubert Cloud Provider, which now actually allows um, a tenant to introspect the underlying Kubert cluster. That's shown on the right hand side. On the left hand side on this slide, we also see another use case for for Kubert, which has been over discussion, and is partially used by um, community members in-house to use Kubert to run uh, virtual network functions. So we know that VNFs have a long history uh, when it comes to OpenStack, for example, and um, people are under pressure to see how, how are those VNFs are used in, in a container native world. How can they be run? We know that CNFs are coming up, right, to move stuff to containers, but they have their own challenges. Um, in containers, it's hard to have your own kernel modules, or then you're very constrained. So the, there's a pro and con for VNFs, but also CNFs. Um, and here, Kubert can also help, because you can take your existing VNF, move it into Kubert VM, and run it on top, of, on top of Kubernetes, and then integrate with stuff like the network service mesh, Multus, um, or for example, Calico. We do not have all those integrations yet, um, but we surely have them inside. Next slide, please. So, so far we talked about the features and how Kubert is used. Now let's take a look at other projects in that space in the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, this is the small comparison of them. So if we look at Kubert, what, what does Kubert characterize best? And I think two things. First, the API, how do you deal with the workload? And the second is, what are you intended to do with that API? For Kubert, we say we have a dedicated API, that's why we say a custom resource. So we have custom resources to work with the workloads and the purpose is to run VMs. If we look at Kata containers, Gvisor, Firecracker and Friends, here the purpose is a different one, right? These projects look at isolating um, pods or containers in order to isolate them from the underlying node. But the API users working with is a pod. So the workflow and the use case are still containers. The next project I want to compare us to is Vertlet. And this is the purpose of that project is also to run VMs. Um, they're specifically focusing on cloud workloads. But here the drawback is that they're using a pod API. The issue is that you cannot really use the pod API, for example, to um, provide virtualization specific features like connecting to the graphical console or um, uh, supporting live migration. That is much uncleaner to solve if if we're reusing the pod API. The last project I want to mention is Rancher VM, um, which is today also providing a custom resource to, to run VMs, which is, not, uh, which is smaller in scope. But the problem we're seeing with the Rancher VM approach is that um, they're currently not focused on, on integrating with, with all of the Kubernetes features, but rather focused on a more um, streamlined experience with, with certain storage backends and um, for example, networking plugins. Yeah, that's a short um, comparison to other projects. Next slide, please. I mentioned the Kubert community uh, and a few more words on those. So first, there's a, a CNCF Sandbox PR app on, uh, on GitHub. It's quite fresh, um, but please take a look. We've got about 1,300 GitHub stars uh, continuing to increase. We have a lot of contributors from Red Hat. That is because we are interested and, and we're going to, yeah, we want to see how we can use Kubert in some of our products. But we also have external contributors, like 17. Um, all of these contributors created about 1,500 pull requests, 270 GitHub forks, and we have actually now 19 releases with the July release. All of the community can usually be found in the community meetings or in virtualization. A channel on Slack and on the Kubert uh, mailing list, which I forgot to add here. Some of our existing users and contributors are Akamai, Apple Cloud, Ferg, Cisco, Lutz, OSI, Red Hat, SAP, and StackPath. Um, the check marks indicate from whom we know how, how, it's going, uh, how they're using it. So we see that we've actually got a lot of users and quite many of them are also contributing to it. All of them are using it for different use cases. Lutz and um, SAP, for example, they work more on the um, hard multi-tenancy model with Kubert. 
and uh, did some adjacent work in other projects. That's why the uh, check marks are in, uh, in brackets. Next slide, please. So why do we want to donate Qbert to the CNCF? Um, we see that we already have a wide um, community for Qbert. Um, and we would like to, to have a neutral ground for that community to, to continue to work on, on Qbert and make sure that there's not the impression that uh, Reddit is steering it to its own, own likes, um, but rather have a more neutral ground. We also want to give Qbert more exposure and hope that if, it's, if it becomes the CNCF Central project, that the um, visibility will be higher. And ultimately, Qbert itself um, can also be seen as a building block. So it can be used to run traditional VMs. We actually have our, um, we are developing a UI for our use case to be able to run classical VMs on top of Kubernetes using that UI and the CLI approaches. But with the um, hard multi-tenancy use case, we also see that Qbert can be a building block for other use cases. Um, and we hope that by making Qbert a sandbox project, um, we, we can highlight that can be a building block, for example, for also for the VNF use case. Next slide, please. So that's it from my side. Um, Qbert is still looking for um, TUC sponsors. And um, yeah, I would be thrilled to hear what you think about that and if there are any volunteers. Awesome, any questions from folks? I had one, uh, it's Quentin here. Um, presumably these virtual machines that, that Qbert runs require a lot of the surrounding infrastructure that pods have, for example, uh, you know, replication controllers, replica sets, daemon sets, jobs, or all of the sort of lifecycle management stuff um, that pods have. Um, do you sort of implement a parallel set of different controllers or do you reuse the existing Kubernetes ones? How does that work? Yeah, so we had that question in the past and we've played a little bit with that. Um, but to be honest, so far our focus was not so much on enabling the use of those controllers. Um, we have a few ideas how that can be implemented, but currently we don't support the direct use of the high level workload controllers. There are some, again, there are some workarounds how you can enable that and we have some preliminary work. Um, to enable the native controllers. And we actually have uh, a VM replica set, which is replicating what the replica set is doing for, for pods. Again, okay. I think the story is, is not answered or not, is, not, is not concluded, but mainly because it's currently not in the focus of, of one of the community members. I, sorry, just to, just to flip the question around, perhaps the other way is, could you explain why you didn't just um, you know, expand pods to be able to contain VMs as well as containers or, or, or take that approach, in which case you would have kind of inherited all of the additional Kubernetes infrastructure. So by the way, we would, I would like to see that. So one of the, so first the VMs are run in pods. So that's not the problem. That problem is we, we technically have is that the entry points to define VMs are custom resources. And if you look at the deployments and other high level workload controllers today in Kubernetes, then the issue is that you can only provide templates for pods. So that means the entry point is the pod, um, it's a pod entity, right? Um, but in order to work with Qbert, you would need the VM entity to be the entry point. And that's currently not possible. The thing we discussed back then was to say, couldn't we create or couldn't we allow the high level workload controllers to template other entities as well? For example, virtual machines in our case. That did not fly. Um, I would actually look if we can re-raise it um, in these times again, because we've seen, for example, with the garbage collection or the eviction API, um, that there are now um, examples where contracts exist, for example, the eviction API from the garbage collection, for example, which also works with custom resources. So maybe the timing when we asked to have templating for custom resources was not you know, wasn't at the right time. And maybe that question would be answered differently if we get back to it today. Does it answer it or was it too verbose? Uh, yeah, yeah so, sort of. I mean, it, it seems to me like if you could rewind the clock and do it again, you might actually put the VMs inside pods and then you would get all the other stuff. But that boat sailed a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. 
Do we have any um, users of Keeper on the call? Um, let me check. So, so we don't. I don't. I mean, I see some from our side, right? I didn't advertise it too much in the community yet. Um, so I did not invite them and they were not aware that this is taking place right now. They were aware that we are going to sandbox it, but um, I did not advertise the, uh, the specific date and time. I was just curious to see if there was a, you know, groundswell of support from the user base saying, yeah, bring it into. Bring it into oh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's obviously, I mean, that's really unfortunate that I didn't share that. So, I, we obviously ask them and we have, we, we can, I mean, we definitely have the support, for example, from Lutz and um, there are a few others, but I don't want to say names now because I don't have the emails in front of me. So I, I can bring up the names which are supporting to bring Kuber to, uh, to the CNCF sandbox, but there's definitely support there. Otherwise we would have not done the step to, to propose it here. I, I'd recommend they just comment on the PR so we could do it offline. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think seeing that I would be, you know, interested. So yeah. Cool. I think. Right. We are short, getting short of time. Can we get through in total in 10 minutes? Yep. We got 15 minutes for the last. 15. <laughs> cool. Thank, thank you, Fabian. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm Santiago. Uh, Justin is here with me and we're going to talk about the uh, incubation uh, application for Intoto. Uh, next slide, please. For those who are not familiar, Intoto is the first framework to secure software supply chains as a whole. It works in and outside of the cloud, but uh, given that the cloud is uh, probably the one that stress tests uh, this environment the most, uh, there are diverse environments with like multi-tenant hosts and different uh, components working loosely in uh, loose connections. Uh, in total allows you to create a policy that can give you uh, security assurance and compliance checks and uh, uh, an audit trail that's cryptographically verifiable. I'll explain a little bit how this works because I think it's very important to, uh, in the context of uh, why in total is important and how it can be very powerful to secure uh, the cloud native environment when creating artifacts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Intoto basically is formed by three components. One of them is uh, uh, what's called the layout. You can think of it as similar to a Jenkins file. It uh, specifies all of the steps that need to be uh, in place. And then it also specifies the interrelationship of the artifacts as they flow through the supply chain. Uh, for example, in this case, we have a version control system that creates some sources, and then it sends them to a CI CD system and also to build farm. Uh, the build farm is blessed to create the final binary that's uh, eventually going to be uh, packaged into a Debian package. Um, the layout also says who is allowed to perform uh, all of the operations in the supply chain. For example, in this case, we have the public keys of Bob assigned to the DCS step and the public key of Carol and Aaron for the building and packaging, respectively. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, while this layout is created, uh, signed attestations as evidence of each step taking place are also created by these functionaries. That's how we call them. That are basically a piece of uh, metadata that says, hey, I did this operation. Here's my signature to rubber stamp it. And these are the artifacts that I created. Uh, this is important because uh, that's how we compare the policy that was created uh, earlier with uh, what actually happened. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is actually used when you are verifying. The end user takes in the layout, it takes the final product, the final artifact, and a series of rubber stamp uh, at stations, and it walks down the paper trail to see that all of the operations that were uh, uh, meant to happen, they actually happened. Um, next slide, please. Now, uh, I think it's easier to understand how, uh, how in total works with some uh, integration uh, case studies. The first one that I wanted to talk about is the reproducible builds project, uh, which is, in, as part of the Debian and Arch, we are using uh, in total to verify that all packages created the, in the Debian packaging infrastructure are reproducible. And not only that, that they are 
it's possible to reproduce these packages in different uh, environments and uh, verify that uh, upon installation. So we have a, in this case, for example, the project owner, the one that creates the layout is the Debian developers. They sign a, they sign a layout saying, hey, this build step must be reproducible. And there needs to be a threshold of uh, end signatures. Right now it's two, but we're trying to bump it to a higher number as we get more rebuilder uh, organizations in. Um, and then these rebuilders are the functionaries, the one that will be uh, rebuilding everything and uh, creating uh, rubber stamp attestations with their private keys saying, hey, I rebuilt this package. This is the, this is the link metadata for it. And finally, the client in this case is the app, the app get installer. It's, we have an app to transport that you can use today to download these packages and actually verify that uh, all of the packages that were installed were reproducible and they were actually reproduced in different, uh, in different infrastructures. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another example is uh, the control plane people. I don't know if they're on the call. Uh, if you wanna say hi. I invited them uh, a little bit late, but uh, hello, hello. <laughs> uh, as part of the lift and shift, op uh, lift and shift operations, they're moving uh, legacy applications into the cloud. And uh, as an add-on, they are also uh, using Intoto to verify that all of the operations that uh, exist uh, during this, uh, during this like Jenkins pipeline plugins, this, uh, this is a very cloud native uh, setup. Uh, are actually uh, attestable using in total uh, metadata. So in this case, for example, a release manager within an organization can create the in total layout, sign it with their private key, and then send it to the in total Kubernetes admission controller. Then uh, the Jenkins plugin will start uh, asking all of the slaves to create in total metadata and then relay it to the admission controller. Once a new image is about to come in into the into the cloud, uh, the, admission, the admission controller will verify all of the, the attestations and the, the layout and make sure that everything's working correctly. And uh, if everything's okay, then the, the container makes it in, otherwise it doesn't. Uh, the third uh, integration case study that I wanted to talk about, uh, next slide please, is uh, Datadog. Um, I also wanted to uh, have Trishank, which is the one that uh, made this happen, uh, talk a little bit more about it from the Datadog side. He's, uh, he's a security solutions engineer at Datadog, and I think you're on the call, right, Trishank? Yep, hi guys, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna try to share my screen, but unfortunately I can't. Um, got like nine minutes, let me try to. Here's the blog post so that everyone can see. Um, is it possible for me to share my screen? You yeah, should be able to do it now. I think we're oh, okay. One minute. Uh, share. Okay, great. Okay, let's do this. So this is the blog post. I just posted it. Um, we wrote a paper about it that's been accepted to use next, all the nitty gritty details. But let me quickly walk through everyone with how this roughly works, right? This, it's going to be great. It's eight minutes. So, okay, but basically we use Intoto along with another project called Tuff, and we'll talk about how they both relate each other to build what we think is the industry's first untrusted CI CD system, meaning, you know, we don't use any special trusted hardware. Um, we can use any generic CI CD system in the cloud, and we don't care if any part of it is compromised between our develop developers and end users, right? We get this what we, uh, a security feature we call compromise resilience. I'll talk about what, how and, and, and what we did this for. So Datadog is a monitoring company. We collect your metrics, your app performance, your logs and so on. And you use the agent installing your hosts and containers to do this, right? And so integrations are just add-ons or plugins that, that you install and give the agent superpower so that you can uh, monitor now Kafka, for example, or you can monitor Nginx and so on, right? So, and we've got hundreds of these things that come out of the box. A challenge was that we bundled all of these hundreds of integrations with the agent every six weeks. And we wanted to decouple them so that people can install new integrations, this new add-ons or plugins out, out of cycle, right? Out of the agent cycle. So that they can test new features. But the problem is that the state of the art, basically everyone uses what we call online keys, basically something like TLS, where you've got robots, what I call robots, signing your, your code for you 
automatically building and signing your code and distributing it to users instantly, right? This is great. Um, your developers don't have to worry about uh, reproducibility, handling code signing keys, and so on. But the downside is that what can go wrong? Well, someone compromises your developer keys, or your uh, they, they compromise your GitHub repository, let's say, or they compromise into your uh, CI, CD, your container image registry. You get the idea. It's basically instant compromise. There's so many of these pieces, and all it takes is one piece, and you your robots automatically build, sign, and distribute malware to your users. We don't want that. We want a feature that we call compromise resilience, which means that even if our CI, CD is uh, infiltrated, we're OK. Our users won't install malicious software. And so we do this using uh, in Toto, which gives us end-to-end -end guarantees about a software supply chain between our developers uh, to our CI CD. And we use this stuff, which is a CNCF project, which is the relationship between them. You can think of a metaphor that Santiago used, uh, which I quite like, which is that in Toto, it's like, so if you think about a bottle of drugs, in Toto is the thing that tells you, oh, uh, this person made this ingredient, this person made this ingredient, and so on and so on, composing it. And tough is the plastic seal around it, making sure that you know things are not tampered with. Um, I don't want to talk about all the details, but um, basically a rough security analysis is that what can go wrong now that we've installed Tuffin in Dodo production. This is actually being used today. I'm going to show you a quick demo. Uh, if our developer keys get compromised, yes, theoretically, people can uh, cause malicious software to be built. But we use YubiKeys, uh, which are this uh, hardware tokens of trust that, that uh, basically store our developers' GPG keys so that you know, even if there's malware compromising the user, uh, we have a secret pin and we have touch authentication to make sure that it's not instant. You would know something funny is going on. And you can't exfiltrate the signing keys. Furthermore, you can use threshold schemes like requiring more than one, so you can say, you know, three developers need to sign off source code before it is trusted by any users, right? Um, but the interesting thing is that now uh, we don't care if our GitHub repository is compromised because signatures won't match, wouldn't match what our developers sign, right? And the keys are stored on hardware tokens called YubiKeys. We don't care if our CI CD is compromised because we would know signatures wouldn't match. Same thing, container image registry, our file servers, and key servers. You get the idea. Let me show you a quick demo of what I would end. Uh, got four minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be wise yeah. to move back to Santiago. Yeah, I would okay. just go sure. back to finish up. Sure. If you're okay. uh, Santiago, you're mute. Yeah. Sorry, that was. Uh... We'll have only three minutes, so I'll probably skip the roadmap. Uh, can we go to the community and other information slide? Yes. So Michelle Riley is uh, sponsoring us. Uh, we want to be in incubation because uh, we've seen enough production use to know that this is not an experiment. Uh, we are uh, we're looking for visibility because we come from academia. So uh, compared to other projects, we don't have as much uh, as much exposure with an industry, but uh, well, that's that's a conversation we can have a, a little bit more in detail. Uh, we also we have this URLs for the website. We have uh, we have three releases per year. Uh, we have a uh, hundred uh, plus stars now. We're having a uh, a lot of exposure now that the supply chain security compromises are becoming more prevalent. And uh, actually, these numbers are on contributors are a little bit wrong. Uh, the last two or three days, we've had the uh, Two more contributors come in, but uh, uh, all in all, we're having a. I think we're having a very vibrant uh, community that we're building up from different places across academia and industry and uh, open source uh, communities like Debian, Arch Linux, OpenSUSE. Um, we're also contributors from Git, reproducible builds, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I wanted to just uh, next slide, please. Just give a quick snapshot of uh, all of the places that you can contribute <laughs> if you would like to. And I also wanted to give a, a quick plug on the next slide, please. We were the first project that had the SIG security uh, security assessment. It's uh, It's been a year-long project uh, a process. We went through 
many iterations and it was actually a very uh, amazing experience which we were able to tighten and verify and review all of our security practices. I think this is very important for a security project. Um, they, this is a slide that they created that uh, basically says what they think about the state of the project. They think that it's a they think the design is straightforward and adaptable. That's that was like a paramount for since the beginning. Uh, they, I think, they approved and they like our security analysis. We also have a spin-off project came out of it of uh, cataloging and uh, tracking uh, software supply chain compromises that probably will uh, kick off soon and uh, under the six security working group. And uh, they made recommendations on uh, have the CNCF uh, assign uh, a US researcher and uh, have a uh, the CNCF uh, help us with resources on certain certain areas. Well, uh, one and, minute away. So yeah, and one last thing is is that on this slide, if you go to the, the actual deck, I've added a link to the full directory with the longer assessments. If anyone wants to see the longer version of the one slide summary here, right. Uh, and that's about it. I'm going to open the floor for questions and discussion because uh, we're on the 12, uh, 12 p.m. mark. I'm just going to add that I know this kind of supply chain uh, assurance is really important part of the puzzle. So I, I'm supportive of this. I, I think we need to do a little bit more digging. I think, you know, the, the space and the project looks like it's on the right track. I think sandbox versus incubation for me hinges on some of the, I'd like to understand more about the governance and sort of the, the 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 depth of the bench in terms of like, hey, is this all hanging on a couple of folks, or is it is it something that will will you know be sustainable? And I think those are those are some of the things that we look you know at the or at least I'm looking at it across different levels here. So, but we can uh, we can take that up offline on the uh, on the on the issue for sure. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Jess, or should we call that a day and take in toto sandbox or incubation discussion offline? Oh, to the PR. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>